I thought that in this video it was time for some reflection. Reflection. Get it? Never mind. This episode is sponsored by PCBWay, more about that later on. What you're looking at is Reflect Olay by Kai Parthi, which has been around for years. There's no AND clause that comes after that statement, it has literally been around for years. That's it. I guess the reason it doesn't get much coverage is because it's expensive and nobody's heard of it or knows what it is and I'm not even sure if they still actually make it. Anyway, for an abundance of clarity before you head to the comments section, this is not an ad for Reflectolay, nor do I even know where you would buy it at this moment in time, nor do I even care if you like it or not. This is another episode in my series of unusual filaments, and that's the point of this series, to deep dive into unusual filaments and see what they are and why. So yeah, feel free to head down to the comments anyway and say, it's not for me, but thanks. Is this worth buying? No, it's probably not worth buying. Is this video worth watching? I think so, because we're going to learn things. There's some really cool stuff. So I think we have an understanding. Let's go. So what is Reflectolay? The answer is a journey, because of course it's a journey. It's always a journey. So let's go on that journey. The basic premise is that if you shine a light on it, it reflects. Now, lots of things do this, basically anything shiny, but this stuff does it in a particular way. It's called retroreflection. Retroreflective materials reflect a fair proportion of the light you shine at them back out at approximately the same angle that you shine it in at, in theory. There's a few kinds of retro reflectors, or I should say a few ways of doing it. The common bicycle is a huge source of retro reflectors because bicycles are a generally pretty passive thing, so you don't want to really power all the things on a bicycle. So they need to be seen out on the road, but not through their own light emission. So it's kind of a perfect application for anything that bounces light back so that the bicycle can be seen, and that's probably why you see bicycles almost entirely covered with reflective things. This thing is probably what you think when you think about a retro reflector. These are intentionally made geometric structures, painted silver, and through the magic of science, they have an angle of reflection, approximately the same as the angle of incidence in most cases. They bounce the light inside, and it comes out the opposite way. I always found them fascinating as a child, maybe that's just me, but they used to fall out of my breakfast cereal. If you're old enough, you'll, you'll know what that means. These are cool, but I doubt if there's a billion of these things in Reflectolay, because that would be some epic feat of miniaturization, and they're clearly doing something else. And they are doing something else, although I didn't expect to see quite what I saw when I zoomed in on Reflectolay. So let's do that. I don't know at what point I became the macro 3D printing channel, but I guess it's probably just because I'm quite good at it. I don't really want to blow my own trumpet, but I've seen other content creators that apparently they don't know that the camera unlocks from the tripod. Anyway, let's go to the microscope. Interestingly, we start to really see what we're looking at here, because for the first time we could see that these definitely look like balls. This is not really good enough though. I don't regret buying this microscope, but it's it's nowhere near the 600 times magnification or whatever it claimed to be. It's fine, I mean, it's, it's convenient, but we can get a lot closer just with um, some basic camera setup. I do explain all my macro stuff on, on Patreon, so if you're a Patreon subscriber, go, go and have a look because I've actually pretty much listed all the equipment I use and, and why I use it and what it does. Anyway, uh, we are definitely staring at balls. 
The surprising thing is how many balls, though. I feel like there's more balls in here than there is thermoplastic, which is interesting, because you wouldn't think that that would be able to print. I suppose it's probably about 50-50. I, I mean, how would, you, how would you guess? But you have to start to wonder how this will print with this amount of whatever in it. But what is the whatever? I think it's time for another diversion. That's a road joke, because... Road paint is typically a thermoplastic. So, of course, you're thinking, what does road paint look like close up? I thought that as well, so I went and had a look. Those familiar looking beads are documented on the internet, though, so we can use the answer to what's in road paint to figure out what's in reflector lay, in case you hadn't already figured it out, and confirm that it is some kind of glass. Glass beads are functional as retro reflectors because they also reflect internally give or take, or that's what Wikipedia says, I'm not sure I'm convinced by that. Anyway, they're probably cheap and easy to make because, as I understand it, you just kind of extrude them from the, the glass from a high-pressure nozzle and it sort of makes these balls. I read about it. I don't know any more than that. So you can throw them into just about anything, including road paint and reflective filament, and it has the desired effect. And yes, we can go closer. At this point, it might seem just like eye candy for the sake of it, because we've answered the question as to what's in the filament. Now, it does look cool, but there's also something here that we will find useful in a moment, so hold that thought. So, what about printing it? I, I didn't actually promise that. I said, let's look at it. I never said, let's print it. So, amusing as it might be to not print it, I guess we probably should. In terms of safety data, it's basically TPU with glass balls in it by the look of it. So the main thing is not to burn it or heat it over 260C. Yes, if you read safety data sheets, I know that people constantly think that I shouldn't read safety data because who wants to, you know, read safety data? But yeah, it does tell you that TPU becomes literally cyanide if you burn it. So for the test, I'm going to use the new Creality flagship printer, which you might or might not recognize here. This thing is quite a big deal, actually. It is the Ender 3 V3. Not, notably, any of the other Ender 3 V3s you might have seen. This one has no letters after it. This is the final, but also the OG... Ender 3 V3. I know. Anyway, I'm going to throw this TPU at the Ender 3 V3, and given the fact that it appears to be made of half TPU, half balls, you would expect that that would be a quick way to block a nozzle, wouldn't you? We'll see. That was actually quite impressive. That was the standard TPU settings, which are extraordinarily fast. I'll put them on screen now. I didn't think that would work at all. I do feel like TPU printing these days is just so much easier because extruder hot end combos are just way, way better designed in terms of constraining the filament. But there is a but. We'll get to it after the sponsor section. So I got these back the other day. If you're a subscriber to the channel and you viewed the nozzle vid, you'll know exactly what these are. If not, you probably missed out on the best video I've made so far on the entire channel, so you need to watch it after this. Anyway, this PCB has been made and assembled by PCBWay, who are the sponsor of this video. I made the PCB in Fusion 360 and I spec'd the components using just the Farnell website here in the UK. And by supplying the necessary files to PCBWay, with those files they actually built the whole thing for me, including soldering the components on. Which is good because I'm really not good at soldering surface mounted components like these because they're actually really tiny. So this will be used in the next Nozzle video, part two, which is coming next, I think, after this. And it's going to be huge in every sense of the word. No pressure. But yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be a really interesting video. Trust me. I've also got a bunch of unpopulated boards in case I'm brave enough to try and solder them myself. I don't, I don't see that happening, but I can show you how cool the black matte silkscreen is. I did mention why I was doing that in the Nozzle video. This is intentional to try and cut down on reflections back into the lens. Anyway, go check out PCBWay and make your own PCB idea into a reality, following the links below in the description where there's also a new customer offer for first orders. Thank you, PCBWay, for sponsoring this video. So, we were talking about a but with respect to printing reflector lay. The defaults for TPU, and this will apply to any printer, seem to cause a horrendous amount of under-extrusion. And 
this is something I see a lot where people don't realize that TPU isn't supposed to look like this. TPU should look smooth and uniform, just like any other filament, like PLA. And if it's coming out fluffy like this, uh, unless it's expanding foam TPU, which is a different product, it might appear like the print has come out successfully, but you're actually under extruding. I think a good part of why this is happening is something that I noticed when I was handling the filament. It's able to be fairly easily stretched beyond its elastic limit, and that's not great for printing. I did also, in later tests, have a couple of blockages, not, not actual nozzle blockages. It's more where the extruder deforms the incoming filament, as we've just said, and it, it can't recover because it doesn't go back to its original shape, so it just gets stuck there and it's unable to push it any further forward. The solution to this was to just generally print slower, and that does seem to solve it. And at the same time, it's solving the under-extrusion problem. Maybe they were one and the same. But yeah, it's trickier to deal with than most other TPU filaments because of this problem. And it sort of behaves in terms of printing a bit more like a 70A TPU than a 95A. I'm talking about shore hardness, if you don't know what that is. I have made a video on that in the past, and I'll try and link that in the description below as well. But speaking of shore hardness, we should probably measure it. Of course, there's also the problem that a filament that's essentially half glass balls and half thermoplastic is also going to be really weak after printing. It's generally behaving as if there's sand mixed in with the filament, which I suppose is pretty close to the truth. And this probably accounts for the matte finish you get when you print it as well. Anyway, one of the key questions I have is whether the printed surface looks anything like the filament surface under magnification, because you might have noticed something when we were looking at the macro images before. If you look at the edge of the filament, you can see that there's material over much of the balls, but I intentionally spliced it to expose the internal surface of the filament, and you can see that this doesn't cut through the glass beads, but it exposes them quite cleanly instead. In theory, this means that a cut surface of filament will reflect light better than a plain extruded one, because making the filament is much like printing it, so you'd expect the same, but let's actually see. You can't really say that the macro stuff was just useless now really, can you? Because it's showing us things like this. So, in terms of just generally printing it with the right speeds, i.e. slow, surprisingly it doesn't tend to block the nozzle, at least on the Ender 3v3 here. I think this is probably because the beads are very tiny, and they're also round and smooth, unlike, say, glitter. So, any potential to block is probably just too low friction, and I don't think they tend to kind of gather together in the same way that bits of glitter can. And again, with uh, macro shots, and this is not just macro, this is macro slowed down. This is 240 FPS slowed down to 25, so that's about nine times slower than reality. You can see that the balls are really small compared to the size of the nozzle orifice. This also looks really cool, especially if you shine a directional light source at it. Thank you. 
And on that note, in terms of how reflective the finished piece is, well, retro reflective stuff picks up low light from a larger distance. So if you just blast studio lights at it, like, like I can here, any nominally reflective surface, like a shiny silver surface or something light, it will probably look brighter than the retro reflective surface. To really test it, you need to be using it in the way it's intended, which is well, further away and with less available light and with very directional light. There is a good reason why road paint and road signs and reflective jackets and tape and stuff all use this technology, even though both of them could just use bright white pigment. So thinking about what you could use this stuff for, well, more than you would think. There is the basic printing something to go on a kid's school bag. There's bike spoke reflectors. As the data sheet says, you can even sew it to clothes. But there's more than that if you think about it. A lot of sensor applications exist that need to specifically reflect light back to a source. So you could create custom sensor reflectors with Reflector Lay 2. As I said at the start of the video, I don't know what the situation is for these filaments by Kai Parthi, or indeed who they are. I feel like half the stock on sale out there is remaining stuff, possibly even from 2018, and I feel like this isn't being manufactured anymore, but that's literally just a guess, as there's no information about it at all. It could still be being made for all I know. I suppose that also means that if you're interested in this filament, or any of the other Kai Parthi stuff, because there's all sorts of different filaments that um, they did or do, then you should probably get hold of it if you can, because you might not be able to when you when you want to, if that makes sense. Ultimately though, as I said at the start of this video, is this stuff worth buying or using? Probably not for most people. If you want your reflective stuff on your whatevers, then you can just as easily buy a sheet of it or tape, and you can cut it out and incorporate it into your prints, and it will likely work better because of the challenges we talked about with the filament covering the beads. And of course, not to forget that other filaments are reflective as well, like metallic silk filament for a large amount of applications where you just need reflectivity close up, those will probably work better. Anyway though, I did enjoy looking at it close up and seeing what makes it work, and I hope that you did also, so I don't think this was a waste of time, even though I'm sure some of you will comment saying it was a waste of time. Sorry. If you like these weird filament video deep dives, then make sure you mention that in the comments so that I know to make more of these kind of videos. Make sure you like and subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you next time. Thank you for watching.